Kendra Hughes is an independent equity and social justice consultant. She has nearly 30 years experience as a training and technical assistance provider and facilitator. Ms. Hughes, has walked, Ms. Hughes has worked across the United States and Pacific Islands helping people and agencies create client-focused systems with intention. Emphasizing core values, vision, and mindfulness, Kendra guides individuals through a process of examination and reflection to inspire change. With expertise in equity and social justice, Ms. Hughes has helped schools and social service agencies create an inclusive culture where educators, students, families, and community members can connect and be involved in the process of change in a meaningful way. Ms. Hughes has a deep understanding of how people can make fundamental positive changes in their outlooks and lives, initiating transformation within oneself and across systems. Ms. Hughes holds a Bachelor of Arts in Human Services from the University of Oregon, a Master's of Education with an emphasis in administrative leadership from Concordia University. Diana Cruz, our symposium chair, heard Kendra present in Portland and came back with rave reviews and said, do you suppose there's any chance we could get her to come to the symposium? And here she is, I know we're in for a real treat. Any chance you can get me to come to U of O? Eugene, heck yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, cadre folks, for inviting me to speak. I have my phone up here if I can keep, be mindful of time. Um, thank you, Marshall. I have been in this game for more than 30 years. I cannot believe that myself. Um, and my, I want to just share some pearls of wisdom that I've lived. My topic for today is the inner and outer work of providing culturally responsive services. And I came up with that title just in the self-reflective process that I'm constantly going through as an equity leader, an equity advocate, looking at challenging myself to do it differently, to do it better, because as, as my colleagues have been saying, and as, as Martin, which, I mean, uh, I'm an anti-techie. I mean, I try. I mean, I have to be sometimes, but I, and, and everything you said, I'm like, I need to do that. I need to do, yeah, all right. And I, you know, oy. so um, I am trying, I'm gonna say that, but I, what resonated me the most with what you were saying, um, and that I think I've heard at the conference is, we have to do it differently in 2017. We no longer have the parents that we had in 2000, 1995, 1990, etc. And unfortunately, we aren't doing it differently yet. Um, I'm an equity and social justice advocate. I've been um, doing this work for nearly, as I said, 30 years. Approximately 10 years ago, I entered the field of domestic violence. And I teach a class up in Portland, um, bad intervention for African American, biracial, and black men. Um, I got into that work as a result of the over incarceration rate of African American men, the impact that this rate has had on black families and black children. Um, and as a as a black female, I'm very startled by that. The recidivism rate for African American men is high in the state of Oregon. Services for men that are culturally responsive, that understand um, what these men bring, um, is 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 non-existent in our state. I um, and so in in, a, in addition to working in P20 educational systems, at my, the heart of my work is education. I have been doing some social justice work, uh, just personally in my in my church and in my community, just to change outcomes for people and individuals that one look like me and all that are experiencing adversity in their lives. Um, so the inner work that I do for myself is, and this is what I challenge you all to do, is to look at who you are, who do you show up as? I show up as a black woman every day. Um, I am an advocate. I was educated in Portland um, in private schools. Um, I have a two-parent household that my parents just celebrated 57 years of marriage, um, which is unheard of because if you perpetrate stereotypes, black men don't stay because they're off to jail or drugs or something and not the black man in, the, in my life. Um, the black man in my life, my father, calls you three times a day. I, I don't have voicemail <laughs> on my cell phone. People will tell me, your voicemail's not set up. No, I don't have it because my dad calls me five times a day and it's, daddy, call me. That's the message. <laughs> Delete. Next message, 
hi, it's daddy, call me. I'm like, dad, your, mess, your missed call is your message. You don't have to leave a message. So I'm like, enough, I just have to take no more voicemail. So that's intentional. We talk about intentionality. I intentionally don't have voicemail because of my dad. Um, and I, as I said, I was raised in private schools. I went to parochial schools in Portland, Oregon. High school, I show up um, to my counselor and I'm all excited because three, I have, there are four girls and one boy in my family. And um, the, the girls are all down in Eugene. They're all going to U of O. I'm the baby, I'm next. Show up to my counselor, I, I have to get ready to go to U of O. What am I supposed to do? What are I? And my counselor tells me I'm not college material. So I'm like, what? Huh. OK, well, but that countered the conversations that I was having at home, that I was college material, that I was going to school. And Betty, my mom, never was the one to sit down and said, let me show you how to do it. She just had the expectation that you get it done. And what do you need to get it done? and really empowered us to orchestrate our outcomes. She, to this day, will tell us, I don't know where my daughters get it from, all of this A-type personality. I don't know where my girls get it from. It's like, OK, Betty. So in my work, um, and she knows I call her Betty when I'm making a point. In my work, um, I've come over the years to realize that equity is not a destination, but a journey. And, and when you are um, least, comfortable, you're learning the most. And when I was uncomfortable starting out at U of O and you know, ch you know, charting my course and being in a space where I wasn't supposed to be according to my college, my high school counselor at my private school in Portland, Oregon, just may I say, um, I realized that there were systems that needed to be disrupted. And, my, and, and that's another takeaway for you all, disrupt. We need to shift our discourse. And we're shifting to this social media concept. It's not a fad anymore. Um, I, and I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. Um, we need to shift the discourse. Dis are you familiar with discourse one compared to discourse two? And I spoke about this in my session yesterday. Discourse one is the lip service, the side talk, the conversations that are not going to provoke change, thought, anything. It's just conversations that happen in a circle. Discourse two challenges the norm. So I enter meetings, I enter, enter trainings, I enter the, the groups that I facilitate wanting to know why. Ask why. When classroom teachers tell me that, that Marshall's not having a, you know, a good semester, he's really struggling, why? Marshall's not coming to class regularly, why? Marshall's not get why? We need to ask why. And we're doing our children, we're doing our families, we're doing our colleagues a disservice if we don't ask why. And I, frankly, I, 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 my head wants to explode if I have to endure a conversation of people speculating of why things can't happen instead of building and establishing relationships with who, those people who need us the most to take that information back to, to impart change. In, in their lives, in their processes. So why? Another consideration that I have for you is when we are talking about our work, when we're talking about our students, when we're talking about our families, we need to remember that if you are not sitting at the table, you might be on the menu. <laughs> Imagine that. And I often hear parents who are having converse, who conversations are being had about our students and about our families, and they're not there. So they are, in effect, on the menu. And that means that they're not going to be present. I, I, I think back, and I wrote them in my notes, the Dove commercial that came out last week. Did anybody see the Dove? I want to know who was sitting at that table that said, it's good to go. Did it, did, do people know what I'm talking about? So Dove had an ad, an online ad, of a black woman taking off her t-shirt and appearing as a white woman. Right, so Dove will transform you. Google it. <laughs> so I, I just, and so, so, and, and so then of course, outrage, social media, social media, social media. <laughs> and I just, I woke up Monday morning thinking, who said, check it, it's good. 
And, I, and my family always says, okay, Kendra, okay, Kendra, okay, Kendra. But I'm like, you guys, we need diversity of thought. We need diversity of perspective. We need diversity of influence sitting at the table. Because I can't imagine somebody who, had, who possessed that ability did not see that and say, it's good to go. You, a black woman takes off her t-shirt and turns into a white woman. Come on, man. Uh, okay. So um, I want you all to constantly examine the impact of implicit and explicit bias. Implicit bias is, is what often leads to microaggressions. It often leads to toxic cultures. It often leads to inequitable outcomes that we're dealing with. We have to exist, the, the, we have to acknowledge the existence of bias. We all have it, let's be clear. It's what we do with it. And when we don't talk about it, it shows up in ways and, ca and causes more harm. So how are you having conversations in your workplace? Conversations socially, conversations um, uh, at a ballpark about circumstances that are happening in society and talking about that and bringing forth perhaps bias. Because again, you know, as I work with the Office for Civil Rights, which for our region uh, is Region 9, they're located in Seattle. The number one complaint in our school system for civil rights complaints is related to microaggressions, is related to bias. Children and families are being treated differently and, and adults in our systems are being treated differently because of a federally protected category. And so someone is sitting by watching that indifference happen without speaking up. I often sit in meetings saying, I need my white allies to show up. I need my white allies to show up. Because when people of color are the only ones that call out inequities, it becomes a people of color issue. And I have to struggle with being the angry black girl, and not because I am angry about it, because I'm passionate about it. And as I said, those discourse one conversations trigger, <laughs> let's be clear, you trigger, you trigger the angry black girl because it's wasting everybody's time. So the inner work, ladies and gentlemen, we need to be mindful of who we are, who we show up with, show up as. You know, our, what are our values? What are, what are the messages that we received from our caregivers and providers, from our school system, from the media? You know, I know black men are brilliant. I know black men are strong, intelligent, highly capable. But that's not the message I get from the media. That's not the message that I get from school systems. So I, and I know across categories, think about the federally protected categories that cover all of us. Across those categories, there are microaggressions that exist that hold us down and hold us back. Um, I'll be honest, when I started the domestic violence stuff, I was like, what, I gotta do this by myself? These men have all been to prison, what? And because uh, I'm culturally responsive and I am trauma informed and my goal is to not re-traumatize, I took what I knew about these men, that yes, they made a bad decision, yes, and, and not all, first, let me be clear, not all domestic violence is I can Tina. For those of you that didn't know that, you know, you know I can Tina. Yeah, not all domestic violence instances are I can Tina. Nonetheless, they are domestic violence uh, incident that requires intervention services. So, but, but my point of that is we all have a journey that we're on and we all have to take influences that shape us. And so disrupt the norm, try something new, make yourself uncomfortable. Because I'll tell you this, as a black woman, I'm uncomfortable all day in many instances, every day because my colleagues don't want to experience discomfort, then therefore I have to. So disrupt that. In our equity work, we talk about intent versus impact. As we talk about microaggressions, I told the story yesterday, I was in a meeting and a woman dropped the N word on me. And it was just randomly in her discourse. So, I, and I was driving down to Eugene thinking about her. Hmm. And I said, she used, that, that wasn't the first time. She's come, her spaces, She's comfortable using that word. So intent versus impact. So I didn't disrupt it at the time, I, and I view that as one of my greatest professional failures. Um, I later had the conversation. I waited for my white allies that didn't show up. Um, but I, I, I handled the situation and talk with her about talking about intent versus impact. I don't know if it was your intent to harm me in that way, but that was the impact that I had. And as the eye of the beholder, 
me i'm the one that says if it was rude if it was inappropriate if it, if it made me feel uncomfortable you can't tell me oh you're overthinking it. oh he didn't mean it that way you can't tell me that and just like we can't tell our young people who are experiencing um you know uh, housing situations and, and housing uh, deprived or food deprived we can't tell our young people oh it'll be okay you know you're gonna make it through because that's that's a micro invalidation you're not validating where they are at that time and space we need to yes affirm use that strengths based language to bring them out of it but acknowledge the space that they're in right then um, so the outer work, what, I, what I'd like you to focus on is the language, attitudes, and interactions. As we're building relationships with our colleagues, with our peers, with our students and families, it's foundational. The language that we use is it strengths-based, asset-based. I sit in a meeting and I hear the term subgroup. We're going to disaggregate the data based on subgroup. Subgroup. I'm like, huh. So I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking, disrupt, disrupt, disrupt. No, let somebody else. Let's I, I, Seriously. In my head, I'm doing all of this, and I disrupt. This is when I was at the Oregon Department of Education, and I'm talking to our evaluators, and I'm like, can we use another word? And they're like, well, what other word would you say, Kendra? And I'm like, well, we want to disaggregate the data, and we want to talk about students based on culture, national origin, language, or um, socioeconomic status. How about student groups? We're going to disaggregate the data based on our student groups. We have students that are grouped by race ethnicity. We have students that are gr grouped by EL status, English learner status. We have students that are grouped by socioeconomic status. It's conveying the same thing, but it's more strength space. Um, we want to use our social capital. I, I tap into my social capital all the time. I think about those instances where there are individuals of, of a topic area that I might not know about too much, but we're in my realm, realm are individuals that can help with that. I've been lately uh, doing some work in the juvenile justice world because in Oregon, um, in our public schools, African American black students are most prominent in jail or corrections. 15% of our youth are in youth corrections and 12.9% are in jail. Different than public school systems, they're in public school systems in jail, major systemic issue. We need to understand trauma-informed care. We need to understand the presence of trauma. And we need to focus on not re-traumatizing because unfortunately, I am trauma-informed. The system that I'm currently in is trauma-informed, but when I was at the State Department of Education, not trauma-informed. So how are we not re-traumatizing our students? Um, cultural humility. It's fine to not know everything about everyone. But what I don't recognize or often see is just that cultural humility and un demonstrating a, an understanding about what you may not know and being willing to be have a better, under to learn more, to better understand. So I would like to see more culture, hum cultural humility. Um, I am a strong advocate for self-care. And the number one thing about self-care is unplug after 5 p.m., I don't respond to emails. Weekends, I try not to respond to emails. It depends on if I'm looking for something. But our work is demanding. Our work is draining. We're, athlete, we're being tasked to do it bigger, better, stronger, faster, without more resources. So self-care is imperative, because I know my students need me, and I know my, my, my colleagues need me. Um, equity is not the position you have, but the position you take. You don't have to be a superintendent in a school. You don't have to be the program director of an agency. You don't have to be the boss. If you realize that something is not okay and harming an individual that in your space, we need to do something about it. I was at a conference two weeks ago, and I'll wrap up, and the presenter said there was a, an issue in a, in a school building. All, it was an early childhood setting. All the kids were everywhere. And you know the parents were like coming in, and the infants and toddlers were in the school age room. The school age kids were in the toddler room, just crazy. So they go in, and it's the owner and a colleague. And the colleague is like, "Oh my gosh! Oh, this is crazy! This is crazy! Oh my gosh! OMG!" And she's like, "No, no, no! Stop! Practice soul." And I'm like, "Soul." Silence observe, understand, and listen. 
And when you talk, so, so, and, and as I listened to the students this morning and heard them loud and clear, listen. So many dynamics that they were impacted by were adults not listening to them and their voice. And so many things, I mean, the young man that talked about he's failing math, but yet gets pulled out for supplementary services during math. And he said, this young man, what was he, 19? He said, do you think that the aid that comes into school one, time, one hour a day could come in at a different time not to pull me out of school during, the class, during a class that I'm failing? The logic behind what those young men said this morning was just amazing. Going back to soul, we need to take a step back. We need to, to be silent, to observe, to better understand, and listen. Make yourself uncomfortable. In my work, you've all seen the baseball game image of the three kids watching the game, and one of them can't see over the fence. You've seen that one. Then the second picture was, they, it's, it, that was equality. The second image is, um, oh, I do have it right here since I'm on the machine that I used yesterday for my presentation. Um, I, it's right on top. My babies. <laughs> this one. So the first one, everyone's at the game, equality. This, and that's not a typo, it's just I changed over to my laptop to this one. I do not spell equality. Uh, everyone's at the game. The middle slide is the students now have what they need to be successful. The third one is the fence is different, so now they can see through. I'm the third slide. My goal in my equity work is to remove barriers. Thank you.